I'm a little behind, but it's a normal week. Uh, I think I might take an extra practice day or a catch-up day on Friday, uh, but I'm not positive. All right, rational functions. This should be uh, part two. You've done rational functions in the green book, but you didn't know end behavior, so you couldn't do all of rational functions. So let's go there. Um, first, rational functions. When you see rational function, think ratio of functions like this, that's a rational function. So if it bothers me first of all, when you I say, hey, you don't have rational functions, you don't know what that means. So that's what a rational function is. Right? Um, it's also tempting for students to say, oh, it's a rational function. So it can't be any use of that. It's totally mindless graphing that has nothing to do with the left. Well, I disagree. Let's start here. Joe. Starts the year off wrong by forgetting his first homework. Wah, wah. For the rest of the semester, he always gets tens on every assignment. Write a function for his homework average as a function of a number of assignments, assuming all homework assignments. <coughs> Sketch the graph. I'll give you one minute to try that on your own, and then we'll talk it over together. Or talk it over with your math and English. Tim, does anybody sit next to you? Oh, Sam, sorry. Does anybody sit next to you? Okay, thank you. I had my mouth full of oatmeal, sorry. Anybody sit behind you? Who? Okay. All right. So this uh, this is the kind of thing that if you're gonna in your real life be able to take all your math that you worked so hard for out of this little box, so it's actually useful in your real life. This is the kind of thing that you have to be able to do, apply your knowledge in a new and different way. It takes practice, and I intend to give you that practice. All right. So, uh, homework average. How do you find homework average? If I said, what's your homework average, what would you mean? How many points do you, I heard, how many points you've earned? And then what's our bottom? What's possible? There's one thing that uh, Devlin kids are good at, it's definitely calculating your grade. Points earned over points posed. Now, X represents how many assignments? Let's do the bottom first. How many points total so far this year? Or at any point? Ten times X. Ten points each times how many assignments? Awesome. Uh, how many points has... Joe earned at any point. He didn't get 10 on the first one, so, but he did get 10 on every other, so 10 times, you could say 10x, but the total points take away 10, because he didn't get a 10 on the first one, or you could also say 10 times x minus 1. I heard that also, and that seems 100% true. With me? Okay, say we graph this. X represents number of homeworks. Y represents homework average in a decimal form. Okay, so it's got an asymptote at zero, which doesn't really concern me because I don't really sweat zero assignments. And at one and beyond. All right, when X is one, what's his homework average? Zero, okay? After he's had two assignments, he took a zero on the first one, he got a 10 on the second one. What's his homework average now? 0.5, yeah? 
chapter three assignments. There's 30 points. He got to zero on the first one, but, but he did well on the other two. So he's got a 20 out of 30 or 66 kind of thing. After four assignments, how many points did he earn? How many points has he earned after four assignments? 30 points, giving you an average of 0.75. All right, so as time goes on, gosh, as time goes on, that means as time goes to infinity, what should I, how should I express that then? If I'm saying as time goes to infinity, doesn't that mean I'm looking at end behavior? As the number of assignments approaches infinity, which might feel like your life, what does the homework average approach? One. Doesn't the zero assignment mean less and less? If you've if you've done a thousand assignments and we got to zero on one of them, isn't that doesn't mean pretty much a hundred percent? It's just a little dip. And so that then that horizontal asymptote or end behavior, that's what he says approaching. It's not just meaningless, it's gradually getting closer and closer. Is this function continuous? <laughs> Feels like it would be. Why not? Somebody give an argument why it isn't. Because it's not. Okay? So, right now, you've done set 27. Tonight we're doing 28. Does that mean you're on a 27 point free assignment right now? No. So, is it real? Is it continuous? Is it all numbers? Is it continuing through decimal numbers? Or is it any whole number? Only whole numbers? So it's integers only, it's not continuous, it's integers only. There's no such thing as a 2.3 as assignment, that's, that's not a thing. Okay? So in this case, it wouldn't be continuous. In calculus, typically we deal with all real number kind of situations, but this just isn't. All right, let's go then to how you can see these rational functions. Uh, this will be a little sloppier, and it would be doggone hard to come up with a real life example of something that ugly. The point of this, although it's mostly a pre-calc problem, there's two calculus skills that I want to focus on. That's the reason I want to hit this as much as I do instead of just blow it off because there is calculus to be learned. All right, so check this out. That's a rational function. It's a ratio of two algebraic expression. And what goes to our head, first of all, is to see where stuff is going on, you want to factor it. So what is this factor? It has the numerator factor. X times x minus 3 and x plus 2. All right, the denominator, again, greatest common factor is an x. And how does it factor after that? x minus 5 and x plus 1. If you're not good at factoring, you will have difficulty with these because you do need to be able to factor. All right, now about the zeros. When you have 0 over 0, what does that indicate in the graph? There's a hole. You need to find the y-intercept, or the y, sorry, the y of the hole by taking the limit. Okay, it's not enough to just say there's a hole at zero, but who knows where it is? Should I put it here or here? I don't. Wait, wait. X is zero, sure, but where's the y of the hole? Well, the y of the hole can be found by saying as x gets closer and closer to 0, what does the function approach? So when you see a hole, you need to, in essence, do a limit, remove the hole, and say the rest of the stuff. What does it approach? As x goes to 0, what does the top approach? Negative 6 over, what does the denominator approach? Negative 5. And so the hole is at 6 fifths. When x goes to 0, y goes to 6 fifths. Just above 1. Yay? All right. Some other stuff then. What about when you have non-zero in the top and zero in the bottom? What is that graph of? You have a zero in the denominator. There's a vertical asymptote there. Okay, where are our vertical asymptotes here? At x equal what? 
negative 1 and 5. So we can put those in. Denominator 0 is our vertical asymptotes. Okay? Uh, what about 0 in the top over non zero in the bottom? 0 in the denominator, is that allowed? What do you get when you have 0 divided by something? 0, okay. And so if y equals 0, then that is a x-intercept or a root or a 0. So in this case, we have zeros or x-intercepts at... and negative 2. So put dots there at those values of x, y will equal 0. Cool? Alright. Now here's, so one of those, yeah, that's it. Uh, now, this is what a calculus is. This is a calculus factor. Oh, I didn't mean to do that. Okay. Alright. Um, it's important in calculus to be able to sign test like crazy and do it well and accurately. It's a huge idea of calculus. You need to be able to have that skill down cold. So that's what this number line is for, practicing sign testing. On that sign test, would you place all x-intercepts and vertical asymptotes? So for example, we need to, from left to right, we have negative 2, then negative 1, then 3, then 5. They don't need to be, you know, accurately scaled or anything. They just need to be placed in the correct order from left to right. So here we go. I want to determine the sign of y in each of these regions. You do that by taking a test point in each region. So if, say, x equals negative 3 is put in, I'm going to look at this here, the whole to me is a non-issue because the hole is going to always cancel itself out. So just look at the what's left here. At negative 3, what's the sign of x minus 3 at negative 3? Negative. What's the sign of x plus 2 at negative 3? Negative. What's the sign of x minus 5 at negative 3? Negative and x plus 1 is negative. Overall you have four negatives multiplied and divided. That answer should be positive. Okay? If I go over to negative, the area between negative 2 and negative 1, maybe negative 1 and a half. Let's do this a little quicker now. Do you agree that the signs will be negative? But now at negative 1 and a half, negative 1 and a half plus 2 will now be positive. The other two will stay negative. I think you'll find three negatives. The sign of that is negative. Negative 1 to 3, a good test point is 0. That would be negative positive, negative positive. That's two negatives, which is positive between 3 and 5, maybe 4, would be positive. 4 minus 3 is positive. 4 plus 2 is positive. 4 minus 5 is negative. 4 plus 1 is positive. I'm getting 1 negative, which is negative. And at x equals 6 or a billion, it's four positives. So it's positive. Cool. All right. Last thing is in behavior. This is number, this is step five here. The in behavior, that's going to be a little different than what you did in the green book. Now, you're going to talk as x goes to infinity, what does this thing approach? Looking at the original, in terms of end behavior, don't we look at the biggest powers? And so what does this function approach as x goes to infinity? 1. What does that mean graphically? Well, that means y approaches 1. And if y approaches 1, that's a horizontal asymptote. So we have a horizontal asymptote. That horizontal asymptote is only for the outsides of the graph, not for the inside of the graph. Do not think, oh, it can't cross that horizontal asymptote in here. When we do a horizontal asymptote, we're only saying what happens as x gets big, which is on the outside. All right, so now, connecting the dots, if you will. The uh, far left side is positive and needs to follow this horizontal asymptote. So follow the asymptote until we get to negative 2. At negative 2, we have an x-intercept, so we need to go down and touch that x-intercept. 
And in between negative 2 and negative 1, the y's are negative. So what should we do? You head down following the vertical axis point. Be careful here. Please don't do this kind of thing. I often see this. Uh, why is that terrible? Yeah, it's not a function. You're telling me that when I put in an x of negative 3, I get two different things? That, no, I do not. It's a vertical line test case. It should never curl away from an asymptote. It should pass the vertical line test. Okay. Um, now I'm at the region between negative 1 and 3. I have two things to go by. First of all, it tells me it's got to be positive, so it's got to be up. And I also have the hole there, so I can say that it must be following that vertical asymptote up there, passing through that hole until it gets to 3. And when it gets to x equals 3, I have a point it must pass through. And then y turns negative. Last but not least, y's got to be positive, and it's got to follow two asymptotes. So what will it do? How about this? Is this okay? Why is that bad? It goes negative. That's supposed to be positive. So if it's going to be positive and it follows those asymptotes, surely it must be that. We? Okay. Now is the time for you to try. Try that one on your own or with your math and English. You have, I'll give you two minutes. Two and a half minutes.
can see close cuts, which is not bad, and think, oh, it always alternates time, which is not true. Ready? Okay, so here we go. Let's see if our graph looks something like positive following. Would you agree with the random behavior being the function approaches zero? Because there's more power in the denominator. Okay, so that means y equals zero, the x-axis is an asymptote, so it follows positively because it's above the axis until it hits the x-intercept, and then it turns down when it approaches. Yes? Oh, shut. Thank you. That changes things, doesn't it? How many vertical asymptotes should I have? Thank you. And that'll change my whole sign chart on it. That'll go negative, then positive, negative, positive, negative. It will alternate. Thank you. So it'll turn down towards the asymptote. What does it do between 0 and 2? I believe it's going to be positive. So what does it do in here? It's got to follow this, it's got to follow that, and it's got to stay positive. So what's it? Yep. Oh, yes, no. Yes, thank you. I have, I should have done my sign chart a little fancy. So I have negative 3, 0, 2, 3, and 4. And you said negative here. Sorry. Okay. So let me start again. Let me start here. Negative three. Zero. Two is an asymptote. Three is an x-intercept. Four is an asymptote. Okie dokie. So you said negative first. So does it follow like this? Are you done with that? Okay. Still has a horizontal asymptote zero. Then turning up. So from zero to two, it should be negative and following two asymptotes downward. So in this case, then the graph should look something like this. How high should that point go? Don't worry about that. That's a question for maximum and minimum work. We'll do later. For now, just know that it turns back down and does not cross the axis. Now I'm supposed to be going to positive after 2. So if I'm at positive following this asymptote from here until I get to that x-intercept, then I turn negative. And lastly, I am positive following the horizontal asymptote, but not proving the way. All right. All right. Hope you did better than me. I tangled it. Okay. Let's go to the second idea, which is not at all rational functions. It's more of a calculus idea. That's why I call this green, this paper green for derivative work instead of white. Okay, now, sometimes a limit problem isn't really a limit problem. It is a derivative problem. Actually, it could be expressed two different ways. We did this before derivatives. We said, well, you can't put one in. And so, what did we do to get around the problem of 0 over 0? We multiply by the conjugate. We multiply by root x plus 1 and root x plus 1, giving the limit as x goes to 1 of the top became x minus 1 without roots, which canceled out with the root x minus 1 in the denominator. And we eventually got 1 over 1 plus 1, or a half, yeah? That's in a pre-calculus fashion. But now that you know some shortcuts, you could actually do this a little different way. You could say, shoot, that looks like which definition? The alternate. The limit as x goes to a of f of x minus f at a over x minus a. Does it match everywhere? Before I use some kind of shortcut, I want to ensure it matches everywhere. So it feels like this is x approaching some number. This is a general function, 
This is that function at one, and this matches. So I feel like there's a perfect match with the definition of the derivative. So rather than do this pre-calculus work, let's use some shortcuts. What's the function that I'm taking the derivative of? Square root of x. What is the derivative of that? Oops. 1 over 2 root x. Or 1 half x to the negative 1 half, but then simplified as 1 over 2 root x. Now, in this case, then, are they finding, they have to to find just the general derivative or the derivative at a certain point? At a certain point. So we want f prime at 1, yeah? If I put 1 into my derivative, what do I get? Obviously, that is c. Now, it's a heck of a lot less work, and then some problems can't be done without recognizing this. So the idea is to recognize the definition of the derivative and then proceed from there. So this is what I want you to show me. First of all, what's the function here in A that they're taking the derivative on? Sine of x. Which definition of derivative is it? This will tell you. Symmetric, okay? What is the derivative, generally, of all sine functions? Cosine of x. And then the third step is optional. Are they, in this case, asking for the derivative at all points, x, or a certain number, a? Do they want it at a certain numerical value, like at pi over 2, or just the derivative? So you are done in that. So for the next one, what's the function they're taking the derivative on? Natural log of x. What is the derivative of natural log of x? 1 over x. Now notice I called that f prime of x. That's the derivative at all points. In this case, though, are they saying take the derivative at a certain point? Yeah, what point? All right, so we have a third step then. We found the derivative, but we said, okay, at 3, though, the derivative is Third. Now that actually is your only way to go on a problem like this because there is no, you know, all that algebra we did above, the conjugate, there's no conjugate, there's no way around it. You need to see the derivative or you're toast. You have no chance other than maybe using a calculator to estimate the length. Okay? Last one more uh, together and then you can do the others. What's the function? E to the x. What's the derivative of e to the x? E to the x. And at what point are they finding the derivative? Negative 1. So the derivative at negative 1 is e to the negative 1 or 1 over e if you like. And that's your answer. That limit, if I were to evaluate it with a calculator and see what it gets close to, it's not close to 1 over e. All right, that's the idea. Write the function, take the derivative, and then if necessary, take the derivative at a point that. Try the next three.
Okay. For this one, what's the function? Sine of x. What's the derivative of sine of x? And at a point, or just generally, and I'm done. At a point, at what point? Pi over 3. And what is cosine of pi over 3? That goes into the derivative, not the original. So cosine of pi over 3 is? Okay. okay. Uh, for 4, what's the function? Cosine of x. Now, I don't know about you, but it cooked me out not to see a difference up there. I thought, what the heck is going on? I usually see something minus something up there. What's going on? Yeah, cosine at pi over 2 is 0, so you can think of it like there's a 0 over here. Um, it's, it's fine. It is a definition of 0. So if it's cosine for the function, what's the derivative? Negative sine of x. Okay, if you don't have those memorized, you should have sine, cosine, e, and log memorized. Right, fast. And f prime at a certain point or just generally? At what? At, at pi over 2. Okay, so what is negative sine of pi over 2? Okay. Uh, last one in that row. What's the function? This one's a little harder. Is it? I felt like is this two plus x cubed, or is it just x cubed? It's just x cubed. Okay, it's just x cubed. And what's the derivative on that? Three uh, x squared by power rule. And at a point or generally? At what point? at 2. And so 3x squared at 2 is? All right. You got it. Do the last 3 in 30 seconds each, and we'll call it good. You can always at least one question on the AP multiple choice. Sometimes two. Hit it. Uh, what's the function in 12? Help me. Shoot. Okay. X squared plus X. This is kicking me out. So this feels like F of X plus delta X. So this should be F of X over delta X. So I think the function is two x plus one. That is not to be not expected, though. What is this? I think I should have wrote this, which was not me. Might have made an error. This indicates that it's at a point, right? What would this be? At what point would this equal twelve? Three, three, maybe? Yeah. That's f of three. Doesn't that mean this should be three plus delta and three plus delta? Uh, it feels like that's 
got an error in it. Scratch that, sorry. Uh, that's what I get for just randomly popping problems off the internet. Uh, what's the function in this one? Square root of x. What is the derivative of square root of x? Over 2 root x. And at a point or generally? At a what point? 9 or 3? 9. And so it is 1, 6. Okay. And this is a great gotcha. This is on the DC Cup and uh, quiz last week. It got a couple of them. So tempting to say uh, two of these answers, but it's actually only one. It's only one. Um, so this, do you agree that this feels like the, all, the first definition at a point, yeah? But isn't the first definition f at 1 plus h minus f at 1? And therefore, the first one is not a definition of the derivative. There is an error in it. Okay? The second one, that is the alternate definition by the book. And so, yes, this is f prime of 1. That is without error. And the last one, yes or no? No. Uh, this feels like the derivative at all points. This is just crazy talk. So that's definitely not. The answer is... Okay, the moral of that story is read very critically and right over the top. Okay, questions on the homework 27, if you have any. 25, 25, do you want to hit the replacements real quick before we do 25? Okay, so for five, these are composite limits, function within a function. First of all, 2f. As x goes to negative 1, what does f approach? Do I say, oh, it's about the approach, so it's 0, or do I say, oh, it's at the dot, so negative 1? Which is it? The limits are about the approach. Now, that said, you're still not done. That means I need to take the cosine of 0, and that is 1. Use the limit for the f, but then that result goes into the cosine, and so it is 1. The other ones are a little more straightforward. The limit as x goes to 2 from the negative side, the y values approach 2. As you approach 2 from the positive side, the y values approach 4. The limit as x goes to 5 of x, f of x. This is two pieces. As x goes to 5, what does x go to? That's the question. As x goes to 5, x goes to 5. Yes. As x goes to 5, f goes to from the po does that say positive? From the positive side, as x goes to 5, y goes to 2. 5 times 2, that is 10. And last but not least, as x goes to 5 from below, as x goes to 5 from below, uh -oh, as x goes to 5 from below, what is f approach? Here's 5 from below, f approaches 1, then that goes into our tangent. What is our tangent of 1? Approach. Pi over 4. That our tangent of 1 means at what angle does tangent come out to be 1? And that's at pi over 4. Okay? Um, whoa, gosh, did not get time for those questions. My bad. Uh, how did these go? Right, right. Sorry. Uh, at any rate, get this to me by the end of the day. I apologize. Uh, I will post at least the replacements online. Any other question you want me to put online? Did you say 25? Okay. I'll do the replacements and 25. Let me know if you want anything else.
so because I'm trying to, I'm fixing the answers right now, so you have them and okay. I have them. Um, so I'll just stay to change it to class. So yeah. Okay. So I'm going to change it on the answers. So maybe you could actually start class with everybody. Go to number 27. Okay. Rewrite that as inverse cosine. Do it, and that, and then great. Okay. Are you cool sounds with that? Good. Yeah, number that sounds good. Number 27. 27. Sounds good. No worries. Thank you.